Violent crime, its causes, effects, and possible solutions were the subject of a five-phase report aired over TV2 on consecutive Saturdays between September 19th and October 17th. In the course of that report, we found some answers, and we were forced to ask some new questions. One of them was based on what appears to be a disproportionate number of blacks caught up in our justice system and incarcerated in our prisons. Tonight, we will re-examine our crime series. This time, we ask an additional question. Is there a legitimate correlation between crime and race? If I went on the arm robbery to do it, it happened, I killed the man, I, I have no regrets whatsoever. I have no regrets whatsoever. If I see that um, I don't have anything to make it with or survive with or my, my uh, child, and everything, then uh, <clears throat> I guess something is going to have to live, or uh, you know, is something just going to have to die. Life means just as much to me as it means to the next person. You know, like I like myself, I like living. You know, I like other people, you know, but uh, business is business. Business is business. That's what I was told when I asked that man why, in the course of a robbery, he casually raised his pistol and shot an 83-year-old woman in the head. Is that what we've come to? Have we reached a stage where violent crime is reduced to a common denominator of business as usual? If we look at the statistics, it would seem so. In the last 10 years, violent crime in America increased 60%. The increase in 1980 alone was 13%. Broken down, it means robbery was up 20%. Forcible rape, up 9%. Aggravated assault, up 8%. And murder, up 7%. Now let us ask who committed those crimes. The statistics based on the FBI's Uniform Crime Report for 1980 may surprise you. In all categories, except robbery, the majority of those arrested for violent crimes were white. True, the black offenders come from a minority that represents only 12% of the overall population, yet the fact remains that most violent criminals are white. Recorders Court Judge Samuel Gardner says the percentages are even lower for the 350,000 people now residing in federal and state prisons. About 30% or a third of those are black. Uh, the other two-thirds are of some other uh, race, uh, and more than 50% of the persons incarcerated are white. Uh, from the appearance of even your program, it seemed like the only persons who were committing violent crimes were blacks, and that's absolutely not true. There are more whites who have been involved in violent crime than blacks in our country. It is not a black problem. It is a problem for the entire country. Telling as those figures may be, numbers, as Wayne County Prosecutor William Cahalan recently explained to a federal task force, is not really what violent crime is all about. We're not dealing with numbers and percentages and theories. We are dealing with Gregory Young, who drove a customer home from the car dealership to her home in Rosedale Park, a section of Detroit, sexually assaulted her, beat her to death, and left her on the kitchen floor for her eight-year-old son to discover when he returned from school. We're talking about Earl Sullivan and Dennis DeGenerate, who shot and killed an 83-year-old man while he was trying to protect his wife's purse from being snatched while they were taking a stroll on the east side of the city of Detroit. We're talking about a 14-year-old newspaper boy who was lured into a home sexually assaulted and brutally murdered. We're talking about a 19-year-old girl who pulled into her own driveway and at that point was kidnapped, taken to an abandoned house, and raped and murdered. I think that we don't have to talk about throwing money at a problem. I think that we should have enough courage to recommend to the Congress that the people of this nation are willing to pay to put an end to this carnage. While violence is more apt to breed and flourish in the streets of our cities, it is by no means bound within them. Always the infection reaches out for new victims, and no one is safe. Either a pope in Rome, <laughs> nor 
or a president in Washington. Twenty-eight young blacks paid the price for senseless violence in Atlanta. A young woman was raped and brutally murdered in Boston. Her death and the manner of it left behind a residue of fear. I walk quickly. I don't make eye contact with people. Um, I just go where I have to go um, and don't take any side routes or anything. Everything I'm going to do now is going to be done in daylight, you know, shopping. Uh, if a cab stops in front of my house, if I get out, I'm going to make them wait till I'm in the door. It just it has to make you more alert. You just have to be aware all the time because you just never know. Certainly the victims of a mad dog shooting spree in Chicago never knew. There wasn't time. Two gunmen walked into a corner market. Within minutes, they were gone, and three people lay dead. When I arrived, there was two dead men in the back of the store. And I learned that the woman was shot. She was taken to the hospital. She was pronounced DOA. And there were, another man was shot in the front. He was shot in the jaw. Can you describe your injuries? We have multiple gunshot wounds to the head on the two men in the back. And the woman, as I've, from what I've heard, has six gunshot wounds in her. From the market, the pair went to a bar, 12 blocks away. Two men came in here, sat down, and ordered a drink. A little while later, they took and they announced that it was a robbery. Dirty took and gave them the money, and he still took and shot her. It was another, while he was sitting at the corner of the bar, and he shot him and says, give me your wallet, after he shot him. But then they took and walked into, went into the house and, and shot my cousin Christine, who was here from Poland, and he shot her for no reason at all. She was sitting watching TV and studying, to learn English. She had been here from Poland for about three years. She was here three years. And she'd done a fantastic job in English, and some guy's got to come and kill her for no reason in the house. When the gunman left, they took the bartender's nine-year-old daughter with them, and sexually molested her with the barrel of a gun. She was luckier than 10-year-old Sharice Alexander, who was raped and murdered in Highland Park last February. The jury says Jerry Vandiver, a man with a history of child molesting, a man just released from Jackson Prison, did the rape and did the murder. Vandiver says he did not. These last few examples, sadly, have become typical of today's street violence. Senseless, brutal, big city. But the cities, as we've already indicated, have no exclusive claim on violent crime. This is Macomb Township, a quiet, affluent suburb of the kind that attracts people who want to get away from the crime in the cities. It was here on the morning of July 16th that 25-year-old Debbie DeRue was murdered along with her five-year-old son and 17-month-old daughter. The things we have just seen and heard are not pleasant, nor were they meant to be. Violent crime is brutal. It's ugly. It's painful for the victims. It's destructive for society. And we wonder what kind of people can do such things. The Michigan Training Unit near Ionia is a medium security prison that houses almost 800 convicted felons. Warden Richard Hanlon, a veteran of the system, remembers a time not that many years ago when the average inmate here was sentenced for the crime of burglary. Today, he is in for armed robbery. In fact, that's probably what Kyle Hocker would have been jailed for if the pizza delivery man he robbed hadn't resisted. As it was, Hocker felt compelled to shoot to kill. It was either me or him. I, I, didn't, I didn't have no fear or nothing. It was just, I didn't want him to get the drop on me, you know, and kill me because of a fool's mistake, so I did it first. As far as me regretting it, I, anything that I set out to do, I don't regret. You know, anything I set out to do, I don't regret. I realize now that that wasn't the right way to do it. You know, I, so, therefore, now it's time for me to change my life around and do something else. I went on an armed robbery with the pistol in my hand, not with the intent to kill, but I knew 
that I'm, it's like a tool. You take a hammer to hammer something. You take a screwdriver to screw. You can't hammer with a screwdriver, and you can't screw nothing in with a hammer. I took it, knowing that if need be, it would have to be used. You were prepared. I, were pre I was prepared, but not with the intent. I was prepared to, you know, look, I got this pistol, and uh, it's going to be used if necessary. I don't want to kill you, mister. You know, just give me the money. Don't, don't fight. He fought, and I took on the something, you know, I thought, well, he's going for a pistol or a knife or something that's going to do something to me. You know, that's when I shot. I, I can't say I regret it. Thurman Morris killed his man with a knife. The guy and uh, the individual who was with me, they was just tussling, you know. So um, I pulled my knife out, you know. And uh, by this time, the guy had almost wrestled the one who I was out with down to the ground, you know. And then uh, I just started stabbing him, you know. Kept stabbing him, you know. And uh, what were you it, thinking of when you started that? Or were you thinking of? When I uh, first started stabbing him, you know, like, it was just like if I was out of my control, you know. It was just out of my control, you know. If I walked up to you then, or around the time you stabbed this other man, and said that something is, this is a matter of life and death, what would that mean to you, life and death? It means you... Uh, life and death, what it means to me is that uh, either you continue to live, either it's, it's time for you to go. If I see that uh, I don't have anything to make it with or survive with or my, my uh, child and everything, then uh, <clears throat> I guess something is going to have to live or, uh, you know, it's something that's going to have to die for something to live. I ain't saying it was easy. I'm saying it didn't bother me. I don't dream about it or think about it. It don't bother me mentally or physically. Uh, I, don't, I don't regret doing it. Did you think about it at the time? Just before you did it? Nope. Nope, I didn't. I just did it. Melvin Lester shot an 83-year-old woman in the head after he robbed her. He says he didn't want to leave a witness. See, I thought if you're going to do something, you might as well do it right. And the only way it could be done right is not leaving her alive to tell him. Now, I don't regret doing it, you know, and I'm doing the time for it, so I mean, there ain't nothing to regret. You know, it was either her or me. It wasn't going to be me. Life means just as much to me as it means to the next person. You know, like I like myself, I like living. You know, I like other people, you know, but uh, business is business.